you're here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Friday night live stream edition. Tonight, we are going to be forging some massive tongs, a really big set of tongs like you have seen in the background of some of my videos. These are going to be big ones. These here are the whole one inch square stock or brown. Um, so here recently I got commissioned to do a very large hammer. And as it is outside the confounds of what I normally do in my shop, I have had to take and create some new tooling all for this job. So good news is I'll use this tooling for future projects. I had some larger forgings that I was wanting to do in the future. And so these will eventually be applied to do that. And it gives me an excuse to swing at some really big stuff. Huh, honey? Yep, that's right. So uh, let us know what you think of the new camera angle. We're doing the camera angle from this direction because tonight, uh, as you guys are joining me along for this ride of me forging out these tongs here, uh, although this isn't really a tutorial, this is just more of like you guys just coming and hanging out with me on a Friday night while I'm getting some work done for customers. Uh, I want to take and talk a little bit about hammer control, how to stand at the anvil, some hammer stance techniques, things like that. And uh, tonight would be a good stream for you to drop your questions about that in the comment section down below as well. All so. right. Everybody say hi to Jessica too yeah. while you're here. So. Hey guys. All right, let's yeah. see what's going here. Yeah, well, let's see. We got, well, I don't know. We already got a good 40 comments, so I'll just throw out a few of them. Woohoo! Hello, everybody. <laughs> Uh, Paul Fontanini says hi. Paul Fontanini, hello, sir. Uh, Hammer Time New York. Hammer Time New York, pleasure to have you here. Dave Faulkner. Dave Faulkner, good to have you in the house. Mm, Pickled Hammer Forge. Hello, hello. County Line Forge says. James. Uh, I used the raw iron in my stream last night, Roy. Awesome. Uh, yeah, sorry I missed that stream. I mean to look, watch it on the replay. Uh, I was busy working very late last night, so I worked till almost midnight last night before I called it quits. Um, been really super slammed with work, so. And it's been hotter than Hades here, so. <laughs> no understatement. So some of my scheduling's getting shifted around. I'm having to try to convert to be a bit more of a night owl just for the fact of, uh, yeah how hot it has been in the shop. I don't know if anybody saw my Instagram post that's on the stream tonight, but it was over 150 in the shop uh, the other day while I was drawing out a bunch of hammer billets. So, mm -hmm. yep. yep, it got quite spicy. Yes, it was very but That's awesome, spicy. James. I'll check out that wrought iron, uh, whatever you used it for there, when I get a second, a free moment off check out your stream. So. Yeah. yeah. Granddad's Forge says I celebrated my first paycheck today by buying the Blacksmith Cheat Sheet. Woohoo! Thank you, Granddad's Forge. Happy paychecks and a whole lot more of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so tonight, um, tonight we are taking a break from the wrought iron hammer. I know I had talked about uh, getting the faces welded on, hopefully doing that in this stream. Unfortunately, right now, uh, I have to do work. I have to do what I do. That's called blacksmith work. So the next several live streams that you may get from me uh, may be project oriented that I'm working on customers orders. And it's just more of kind of like a Q&A session, less of me trying to teach you something. And hopefully you'll still learn something just through the process of me working. Um, that's the only way I'm going to be able to make the live streams reasonable to continue doing uh, going forward right now until I get ahead of some of my orders. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's okay. Let me know if it is in the comment section down below and Jessica will hopefully read out a few comments. Yeah. Uh, Drayson69, hello all. Can't hang out. I'm grilling beef and brat burgers. Well, Don't burn them. Mm, yummy, yummy. <laughs> Drayson69, thank you, sir. Oh, and I received a package from you. Very thankful for it. Thank you. And uh, I believe you sent an email out. I think today. I did. Uh, no, I may have just read this message. Okay, we just read your message, but we will be getting back with you, sir. Thank you. Let's 
Let's see. Uh, Hammer Time New York says practical work videos can be the most helpful. Good. Glad you feel that way. I want to get back to, I'm not going to shelf the wrought iron project. That's something I've been wanting to do for like the period of the last four years or so. So I am going to get back to that as soon as I can, but you got to make hay while you can make hay. David Wenzel says, hey guys, I started my wooden power hammer this week. Awesome plans. Hey, awesome, David Wenzel. <laughs> got to send us a pic how it went for you when you get it done. Mm -hmm. Love to see that. Coffee Thank Sports. Thank you for buying the plan. Coffee Sports says, just getting it started and gave us a $10 super chat. Hey, Mr. Coffee Sir, thank you. Getting the ball started, eh? We appreciate you. Now everybody jump on his bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> if life was only that easy, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Drayson69 says, cool, hope you enjoy the crucifix. What's that? He said, cool, hope you enjoy the crucifix. I did. I like that. That's going to find a special place on the wall inside my home. Oh. Ridge and Ironworks, hello, Jessica and Roy and the rest of you hot steel hammering fools. I mean that in the most utter, utter, <laughs> uttermost respectful way. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Hello, hello. So it's been hot in the shop. Um, the last three days, it's been in the shop because I've been happy to have the gas forge running because I've been doing, well, <laughs> I meant to shoot a workflow video and I had a, I was trying to figure out the time lapse on the camera, I couldn't get it figured out. Basically it condensed like four hours of work into like two seconds because uh, I had my camera settings set wrong. But uh, I was going to talk a little bit about workflow in the shop and uh, I had the gas forge running, I had a chop saw cutting. And when that wasn't cutting, I was pressing stuff, I was forging stuff under the power hammer uh, back and forth. If I wasn't doing that, I was grinding and cleaning up burrs and you name it, basically, uh, for the last three days, that's been the equivalency of my life. So uh, it has been quite hot, and I do mean hot, where 95 degrees feels like a fresh, cool breeze, like a nice 60 degrees is what that feels like. And so, uh, so it's been one, one sweaty time. So if I seem a little bit out of my element or I look like I'm a little uh, slower on the uptake today, it's probably because my brain is cooked. And probably my giblets. And anything else, it's fleshy on me. I've been cooked this week. So it's kind of nice to stand by a nice, moderately warm coal fire mm, instead yeah. of in front of a gas forge. Yeah, it was it was really hot. I came out for like 10 minutes. <laughs> yep. yep. You might have to speak up, Jess. All right. So they can hear you. All right. When you make comments. Uh, what the Forge says, Roy, I have finished rough forging on five chasing tools. Awesome, What the Forge. Sound like you're going to be in it for some fun then. Here before you know it. I asked everybody in the comments how it looked, and they said, uh, the stream looks good. Hammer Time New York says, looks great, but the main camera orientation is goofing me up a little bit, but quality is on point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. a little different this time. Sorry, it's goofed you up a little bit. So, all right, so here comes some learning while I'm at this forging. So basically, I'm forging tongs, right? Forging really big tongs. I don't know if you guys see that. Let's go to the anvil, Jess, see if you can see this. All right. I can't really see it in the viewfinder, but does it look good on camera? Yeah, we're good. So we're forging a really large pair of tongs. These are meant to be like hammer tongs, and they're for this 30-pound billet, or should I say 37-pound billet that's going to become a sledgehammer. This is a custom sledgehammer that I am making for a guy. And yes, that's sitting on top of a 465-pound anvil mm -hmm. for scale. This is a three pound forging hammer, Ooh, don't also that. for scale. You wouldn't want that to land on your toes. Nope, so you can tell how big that thing is. Mm -hmm. So basically what I'm meaning to do is I'm meaning to make myself a pair of tongs that can grip around this billet in the up direction and also be able to grip in this direction. So the trick to this, basically we won't get this far tonight because the larger the tongs, the longer they take. But 
we are going to make it to where it grips around the circumference here and then it's going to be split so it grips it on the end like so. So this way this piece can be manipulated. That is one of five pairs of tongs about this size that I have to make. Uh, so that's one type. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw this out. We're starting with inch by inch square stock or 25 mil by 25 mil square stock. The reins have already been drawn out using the press and the power hammer. And we started with a billet that was 16 inches long. It was nearly 16 inches long for these. So that's about how much you get out of that. What people say, huh? All right. Uh, they laughing in the comment yeah. section? Yeah, B&B Ford says, who would want to swing that? <laughs> Hammer time, New York, that's a bit huge. <laughs> that it is. So, all right, let's go to main camera. You the main camera? I am um, no. Maybe. Okay. All right. So, this here is the very first hammer I started with a really long time ago. This is a three-pound Harbor Freight cross peen hammer dressed hammer faces for forge work. So this is the same three pounder you can go down. I just checked it earlier this week. You could go down to any Harbor Freight and basically buy these hammers. They're really cheap. They're made in China. Uh, great hammer. It's held up well for a lot of years now. So it's a it's a great hammer. I can't say enough about it. They, they did it right. It's had about four different, four or five different handles. I don't even remember how many handles I put in this thing. Uh, but that's what we're going to be using to work on this one inch. Now, that is not my preferred. My preferred hammer is to work with this hammer right here that I made. This is a wrought iron hammer. This is one and three quarter pounds. Made this in class with Tom Latman. That is my main forging hammer I use every day. This is what I consider to be about the maximum that you want to take and work with on any given day for any length of time. I can still swing this just about all day, but it's like a sledgehammer in the shop. It's what I use one-handed. Now, I do have another hammer down here that I have used on occasion to drive a drift or two. And this here is a six pound cross peen hammer and it's got a really short handle to it. And again, I use this to drive drifts or a big punch or something like that. Or I should say I used to before I had power equipment. You are not meant to swing this all day one-handed. These were meant as sledgehammers to be put on a handle that you grip with two hands to support the weight. And so is every hammer from this size on up. So anything that you get above about four pounds was meant to be put on a handle, two hands. And so that is actually traditional that way. Working with a nine or a 10 pound club at the end of a stick and then gripping it by the head is not the proper way of hammering on material. We were supposed to learn from our ancestors and move beyond that when they figured out how to put a hole in the center of a piece of metal and put it on the length of a wooden stick that they found kicking around the yard somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so let that be, that is my opinion of proper hammering technique and control. So now I'm going to show you what that looks like. A lot of people have a problem hammering material that is one inch thick material or larger. And the reason why is because one, you trying to get too much work done. There's a little bit of a thing in your brain where you think, okay, when I hit 3 8 inch thick material or 9.5 mil material, I expect that material to move a certain distance at each hammer blow. Your brain gets trained to think this way. And then when you get to one inch material, you do the same thing. You do the same thing. So your brain is cultured to think that that one inch should move that same distance each time you hit it like the 3 8 does. But it doesn't. It definitely doesn't. So what that has, it causes you to do one of two things. You either increase your hammer size, 
so you satisfy your brains in your visual hand-eye coordination to seeing that material moving out, or you start swinging for the fences harder and trying to push the heat longer than what you should. Bring this up to a high heat, almost a welding heat. Bring it as high as you can, and you need to work it with good, strong, steady blows. They need to be steady. They don't need to be swung like a jackhammer. You're not trying to swing them super fast. Hit it until it feels like it's starting to give you that resistance, or if you feel your arm fatiguing, like it's getting a little tiresome to do it, stop. Put it back in the fire. Rest. Rest come back in, pull it out, do it again. That is the secret to working really large stock at the anvil. And one inch drawn out by hand is large stock at the anvil for any human being. I don't care how big you are. It is hard material to have to draw out by hand. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what the Forge Blacksmithing yeah. says, Roy, if you have to choke up on the handle just to lift it, it's too big for you. Yep. Hammer Time New York says they have the two pound hammer now. I got the two pound and ground a peen into one. From Harbor Freight, I believe. Okay, I cool. Yep. Oh. All right, so I'm going to bring this up to heat real quick. It's almost there, cooled down since I was talking. I'll bring it up as high as I can get it in temperature. I'll bring it up as high as I can get it in temperature. And then I want you to pay attention. We're going to stay on this main camera for this first heat. I want you guys to take a look at my hammer form. This is what I believe is proper hammer form. Now, that is just coming from the way I swing a hammer, the way I've been taught to swing a hammer. And so it is what I will teach you as proper hammer form. There's a lot of other methods out there, and this is not a dig at any other method. This is my method that I'll teach to you. If you don't like that, there's plenty of other channels you can go learn from. Although I don't think they're doing a Friday night live stream, so you may want to stick around. <laughs> Hammer Time New York says I'm chill now, going into weekend mode. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I hope everybody found some sort of information on that. The, the subject around camera control, technique, things like that is a dicey subject for anybody to get into. And every smith has a different way of hammering. And ultimately what ends up happening is a smith that does it for any length of time, and I do mean a length of time professionally or for a long expanse of time, your body will tell you when things are a big no-no. So if you're holding your hammer clear up here and, and your elbows are ringing and your thumb, this joint right in here, it's your thumb and all that, it's all sore and bruised and feels like somebody whacked it with a hammer at the end of the day. Uh, there's another one where you stop short to flick at the anvil and these fingers right in here get really sore. You get a pain that comes and radiates up the top of your hand like so or you get a pain coming up your wrist. That's from different things. And what ends up happening is, if you pay attention, as most people do, your body kind of just starts adjusting. You just start adjusting your grip because, hey, that's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable. And enough of those, it wires it into your brain to adjust your hand, to adjust your arm, to adjust your grip. Unfortunately, though, a lot of times it's too late. You've already done the damage and you've done it repeatedly for a whole day, maybe a thousand hammer blows later, you've already done quite a bit of damage to yourself. So a lot of people get pretty sensitive, um, myself included, about the whole hammer technique thing for those reasons. Graham says, if it works for you with arm problems, then I want to know your proper way. <laughs> And like I said, this is for a guy on my frame, my build, kind of the way my, my hands and wrists have developed in my arms and my troubles with particle tunnel and other joint issues that I have. And this is just, 
uh, it's not a method necessarily that I've developed. It was one that I was taught that took me from having a lot of pain while forging and it stopped the pain. So I pretty much religiously subscribe to this method. And so that's the way I do it from now on out. And that's the way I teach. What's up, babe? Um, not much. I was just I was smiling. Uh, there was a little bit of debate about if you turned your hand, your anvil or not. <laughs> yeah, it's just a different camera angle. Nope, just a different camera angle. Oh. All right, so this is good and hot. We're going to go to the anvil. I'm using half on, half off blows, and I'm drawing out the material. This is just like as if you were to set the nibs down. I am not using rectangular bar, which is my favorite way of doing it, because I don't have rectangular bar in the right dimension to do this. So I chose one inch square because I had a lot of one inch square sitting on the rack. Uh, so we are going to draw it off, half on, half off blows, basically like you're drawing down the nibs of your tongs. I'm bringing this out, and I want you to pay attention to my form. I have a dot in here somewhere I'm trying to find. Get this lined up. What I'm doing here is basically I'm throwing the whole thing from the shoulder. So I'm coming up here, using my shoulder, not just my elbow. I'm using my whole shoulder, and I'm flicking that hammer. And I'm following through with my hand. I'm not stopping my hand so it's getting caught on my wrist. I'm following all the way through with my hammer blow. That is way too cold to work now. You can see how it's rebounding my hammer blows. They're bouncing off all crazy like. That's going to cause you injury. Don't do that. Stop. Put the thing back in the fire. Bring it back up to a welding heat. Xander Nichols says, how do you avoid blisters on your palms? <laughs> because it's not shifting inside my hand. Um, when it comes to blisters, <coughs> some people talk, it's all this, it's, you know, it's like this, it's being held just by this one finger, um, stuff like that. I'd like to say that that's a bit uncomfortable after a period of time, whether you know it or not. I like a firmer grip on the hand. And so it is not it rotating in my hand. It is my arm rotating around that's doing that hammering. So if I move with my joint of my wrist, I'll feel it in my wrist too much. If I just move it with my elbow, like I'm doing a pushing stroke like that, I'll feel it right here in the elbow. And a lot of times you'll get a Charlie horse if you're gripping it too tight and you're just working and punching it with your elbow. Um, so it is a whole shoulder rotation. What you see of that flick at the end is that hammer accelerating at that end point because I'm coming down and I'm following, I'm pulling this arm short like this. See, like that. And that's what you're seeing, that flick at the end. Now, when you're first getting started in forging, you may notice that you do start to get some blisters. Those are gonna be a thing of life until you get your own hammer styling down and until you build up what they call calluses. The, the friend of working men everywhere. It's called <laughs> calluses. So I basically 
in my earlier years, and mainly because I had a death grip on the hammer. And then I went to a style where I was trying to just hold it with two fingers, and it rubbed me to death um, when, I, when I did it that way. And I had blisters to beat the band. And then those turned to calluses, and then the calluses had blisters, and then those turned to more calluses on top of my calluses. And now the whole palm of my hand is pretty rough. It's basically a callus. So I don't get that many blisters anymore. Uh, up until I built my power hammers, what, about four years ago? A mm -hmm. little more than that? Yeah, that sounds about right. A little more than four, probably? Mm, maybe. You think? No, it's about four. Three to four years ago, I built my first power hammer. Um, well, no, it was less than that. It was like three years for that big hammer there. Oh, yeah. It yeah. wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. Anyways, since I got power equipment into the shop, uh, you know, on large stuff, I don't swing big hammers anymore. And so that's why, you know, it's a lot more comfortable. The hammer handles are really smooth. They fit my hand. I don't have any rough spots on them. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that kind of comes into that. It's not just grip. It's not just stance. It's not just hammer form. Uh, there's a lot that goes into... Um, how do I say? There's a lot that goes into being comfortable while you're forging. Everything from picking up the right hammer to start with for the work that you're doing, swinging it at the proper pace. You know, moving to a lighter hammer if you're getting tired and wore out through the day, or if you're Charlie horsing, or if your arm's locking up, stuff like that. You, you kind of start getting the system figured out as you go along. Corey Shire says they're called working man's hands, lol. <laughs> Xander Nichols says if you could recommend a power hammer, which one would you recommend? Um, I've been looking at them here lately. Uh, some commercially manufactured ones. I personally, I personally like, obviously, like Ang Yang power hammers. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them. But I personally like a -Yang power hammers. I also like, I like Ken's custom irons. He has an MZ100, although I would like to see a lot bigger power hammer in his range. They are pretty pricey. Uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of work that goes into them, but you can also pick up a 155 pound blue max for just, almost half the cost as a Kim's custom iron power hammer. Um, but those are utility air hammers. I'm not as big a fan of utility air hammers as I, I don't know, I've always kind of ran towards mechanical hammers. I like mechanical hammers quite a bit. Although I am planning on building my own utility air hammer here in a little bit and giving it a shot and seeing how it works. But I'm designing it for a very specific purpose has very specific dies that will be going into it. If I were to have to recommend one for a guy, if you're just trying to buy one, if you have a big enough air compressor, I would suggest probably Big Blue at that point, um, just, just from what I have seen on uh, pricing versus value of what you get with service and stuff. Yeah, and as what the forge uh, pointed out, we do have some blacksmithing plans too. Yes, if we you're do. Looking to build one, we've got several wooden Let me power hammers. Close this door here. Go ahead. Okay, good. Yeah, we have a couple of wooden power hammer plans, and also a few metal ones. Uh, a miniature power hammer for the anvil top, and also um, Roy's main shop power hammer, which I'm sitting right next to. Uh, but yes, our blacksmith or our website is blacksmithpdfs.com, and you can get some information. And there's like some. Uh, videos embedded there as well. Yep. So. All right, honey, let's go to the anvil. Now right. I'm going to show you guys what the hammering technique looks like at the anvil. Okay. So I'll be the first guy to tell you that there's no shame in taking another heat. As long as this 
this is moving good, I'm going to hammer it on it. And about this time, it's a good time to just throw it back in the forge. But you can see this is one inch material, one inch square, and I've already reduced it down to about an inch and three eighths by about a half inch thick material in just two heats. But that is because we can take and develop. That's because of the way that we are hammering, we can develop a full length of hammer stroke. We are using the full length of our lever here to develop that extra bit of power and velocity into the piece. And that's what allows us to get such great kinetic energy to move a piece like this. And if you notice, so it's just kind of jumping around at this heat. That's why I said there's no point in keep hammering on it at this point. That's a planishing heat. We want to stick it back in the fire and bring it back up to a welding heat. You like main camera? All right. All right. Any questions? See, William Pratt says I painted my roof white and insulated it with spray foam, and it's been up to 20 degrees lower than the ambient temperature. The white roof really helped. <laughs> huh? That's cool. Maybe that's maybe that's what I need to do in here. Right. <laughs> Just spray some foam up at the top ceiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just insulate the ceiling. Uh, Ralph Neumeister says, I'll see you next weekend. Rabbit conference. Okay, awesome. We'll see you at the Rabbit conference. Yeah, I'll go ahead and mention that real quick. And I did put a link down in the description. Also. Okay, just put a link in the description, didn't you? Yep. You have to make sure you tail cut well enough to right. hear you. Yeah, they can oh. hear me. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, I'll be doing a demonstration at the Rabbit Conference. We will be demonstrating live there at Burton Century Village, doing a sledge block, hand forged sledge block, and then I'm doing I'm doing this style. And if time permits, I will be doing another type that has the drifted square holes in it and things like that. If we have the time and the load to do so. We'll see how the first one goes there. Uh, I've never been there before. I'm not quite sure of all of their facilities and everything they have. And things are always different when you're doing something at a shop that's not your own. So, uh, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping it'll go really well. And I'll basically be sucking on my gums on the second day, saying, "Well, what do you guys want me to show you next?" <laughs> Oh, maybe, we'll just, maybe I'll just continue on making big sets of tongs <laughs> if we get the time. It ought to be a great time, though. Swim Baiting Ohio says, Hi, Roy. I was able to grab some bolts that were used to hold oil pads together, and they move pretty easily when hot, but when they, when hardened, a file does not bite well into it. Any idea what steel they are? They are, they are bolts for what again? Uh, oil pads? Oil pads. I'm not sure what an oil pad is. Um, I'm assuming some sort of mechanical thing or around the oil industry well drilling maybe. In that case, if you harden them or you quench them, they are a, probably a known quality steel. The best thing that you can do to find out what, what the material is that you're working with is try to find your local scrap supplier and ask, go in and ask them, say, hey, I want to bring in a truckload, say whatever, okay? Or say you, say you want to say, get in the back door approach. I hate telling you the lie, but, you know, basically just go in and say, hey, I've got this material. I don't know what it is, could you tell me what it is? And a lot of times they have a gun right there at the scrap yard. If you're lucky, they might be nice to you and I'd be like, Doot! it's a little laser indicator thing and it'll give them exactly what that material is likened to or the best likened to. So that would be your best bet to figure that one out. As far as a known hardenable quality steel, 
Who knows? Could be anything. There's thousands of different varieties of high carbon steels and high carbon tool steels out there and all sorts of alloys and such. But it sounds like you got lucked out. Make some chisels or hammers out of it. Uh, what the Forge Blacksmithing said, Roy, is there a way to scale the hardy hammer down for use on a 112 pound NC cavalry anvil? Uh, yes, there is. Basically, you just have to shorten the base. Um, the base I made, I wanted it to be deeper. You can shorten the whole shafting and everything like that. You can compact it even more. Uh, you may have to figure out something besides the motor that's in the plans or on the print. You'll have to take and figure that out, how you want to take and do that. Uh, it, yes, it's entirely possible, though. Uh, the weight of the hammer should be fine for the weight of the anvil. All that should still be good. You just have to shrink everything in this dimension, not in this dimension. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, William Pratt says there's cast iron casting lessons available at Sculpture Trails in Green County, Green County, Indiana. They have the largest remelting facility east of the Mississippi. They're on Facebook. Wow. Huh. screenshot that. That'd be an interesting thing to go take a class at, huh? Yeah. That's one thing I don't know a ton about is casting. I've got the concept of it, but that's like anybody else who kind of understands metalwork. You get the concept, but there are so many nuances and ins and outs of the whole casting industry. You really got to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you can end your day very poorly. So. Right. So let's go over the anvil, Jess. All right. Do this again. Good. Yep, we're good. Okay. So now I'm going to start drawing out some more. do that, I'm going to go ahead and set up this little transition point. I want to talk about where you want to set that at. I'm using half on, half off glues. Get this little transition point set. And we're doing it cold at first. So hopefully you all can see that. Uh-huh, yep. There. So, if you notice, let me get out Mr. Thing here. This point here is not right in line with this here. You don't want it to be right in line with the tip or the toe of your boss here. You want it to be about a quarter inch in front of that point. What that's going to do is that's going to allow you clearance between the two halves when you put them together. Okay? That's going to provide you clearance between the front of your toe of your one half. See? I hope you see that. Yep. Can you all see that? Uh-huh. It's going to provide you clearance between the toe of your one boss and the heel of the other one. If that makes sense. You guys can see how that lines up. See how it lines up now? If you were to just make it right on the boss itself, right in line with that, you would actually have part of the heel here. This heel would be back here in the center of your boss area. 
and then your jaws would hang up. So you got to give it that quarter inch clearance or tolerance. Now it's quarter inch on something this big, it's much less on smaller tongs. But you give yourself that little bit of clearance for the offset in your jaws. So this way they line up better. You guys are on fire. There's so many good questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, up with them. All right, Corey Schreier. Back to the main cam. Roy, uh, with as hard as you're hitting it, aren't you glad that your anvil doesn't ring like a bell? Uh, yes, I am. So my anvil does ring like a bell, by the way. It is the subject of the base. So basically, the base stops it from ringing. I have a iron base, or a steel base, if you will. The base itself is 350 pounds of steel. That's everything included, and that's just steel. That's not including whatever's in the sand. I don't know what's in the sand, but then it has sand-filled legs, and it's that sand that's in the legs that stop the anvil from having reverberation and or allowing it to ring. So basically, it's sitting on a dead base or like a dead blow base, and that dead blow base stops the ringing of the anvil. It'll still make a pretty high pink noise, but it's not going to make a boo bell-like note. Graham, thank you for the $2 super chat. We appreciate that. And I did do, send you an email a little earlier answering your question about the tulips. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Graham. Make sure everybody give him a hand clap down there. Also, I did say it earlier, but make sure to give Mr. Coffee a hand clap. Mm -hmm. And thank him for supporting the stream. William Pratt says, Roy, do you ever visit other shops in your area? Are you too busy? And where are you generally? Um, <laughs> not really. I don't usually visit other shops. I'm generally too busy for that. Um, the best place to meet up with me here in Ohio is at SOFA. Uh, I will actually be there tomorrow afternoon for the meeting. We have a monthly meeting the first Saturday of every month. And so I will be there for a short time. And then I won't be there. <laughs> because I have some other prior commitments just shortly after the meeting ends. So, so I'll be going to run around to those. Go ahead. Tim, he said, I like big tongs and I cannot lie. I think it was a $20 super chat. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, the big dog fart. Yep. <laughs> I, I can imagine you singing that song, Tim. <laughs> Tim, whatever you do, don't make a music video about that. <laughs> just, just don't. Just don't. <laughs> For anybody who knows that song reference and has seen that music video, it would not be good. <laughs> or family friendly. <laughs> Thank you, brother. You are awesome. Thank you for the $20 super chat. Xander Nichols asked if you could choose between a double horned anvil or a London patterned anvil that were both the same weight, which one would you choose? A double horn or a London? Yep. Double horn all the way. Hence Olga. <laughs> Hence Olga. <laughs> Olga has been my dream anvil ever since I got into smithing. I saw a small little double horn once at Quad State. I loved it. I never got to work on it. Years later, I got the opportunity to go understudy with Tom Latinay. He has a little small double horn that he was working on to do lock work. And I absolutely drooled over it, fell absolutely in love with it, and set my heart on getting one someday. Um, although the small ones were always out of my billfold and budget. And then one day, my wife, I was looking at one, kind of dreaming and drooling over it online that a guy had for sale on eBay. And then she was like, you want it? I'm like, well, yeah, I want it. I'm like, but we can't do that, this, that. She's like, just go get it. And how many men know here <laughs> when your wife says, go get a tool, you go get a tool. And so that's what I did. So you can thank, I think, Jessica every day for Olga sitting here in my shop. Uh, 
Uh, William Pratt says, do you custom shape your hammer handles to spare the tendonitis? Uh, <laughs> I do very little shaping. I have found that the factory shaped handles basically fit my hand already. Uh, call that the luck of the draw. I'm just lucky like that. They basically fit my hands. Um, now, I have had some that I have bought before, like the larger handles, and they got like a big grip. I mean, you'd have to have a big old bear paw in the man's hand, basically, to grip them, or super long fingers or something. Um, and in that case, I'll whittle those down to about what this standard off-the-shelf handle is. Big Dog Fortes, you're welcome, my friends. You are awesome, Tim. If you all haven't checked out Tim over at Big Dog Forge, you definitely are living under a rock. He's doing some great things over there. He has graciously him, David at Work With Nature, and John Switzer at Black Bear Forge has graciously de decided that they would collaborate with me. I sent some wrought iron to all three of them, and uh, they're making some different stuff. And I don't know what <coughs> Big Dog Forge is making just yet. I do know that John Switzer over at Black Bear Forge, he's going to be making a dragon head door knocker out of it, so that ought to be pretty sweet. So definitely check out all those channels I just mentioned. If you're not subscribed, get subscribed to them. Yep, and down in the playlist, or down in the description, you'll find that playlist of all the videos so far released around that subject. Yeah. All right, this is good and hot. Let's go back to the handle. All right. And if anybody needs to see my hammer technique one more time, we can do that too as well in the next heat or so. Okay. make mine slightly larger handles. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Xander Nichols, yep, the green team is for identification of Roy's tools when he goes to class and demos. Uh, Dana Maggiore, you asked earlier if we have a Patreon. We do not have a Patreon. Uh, we do have a PayPal donate button. The link to that is down in the description. And also down at the very bottom, uh, we have our Instagram and also some other ways that you can support us if you're interested, uh, such as our, our t-shirts and stuff. That's on Teespring. And yep. we have plans and stuff like that. You can download at our website as well. Or you can also just support in the super chat whenever you get a second. Um, you can do it that way as well if you want to support the channel. Many people choose that route, and we greatly appreciate any support anybody wants to give. Good. Now we're getting close. One more heat to clean this up, and that'll be a route right. Basically what I'm using is I'm using my anvil as a benchmark. Olga, old girl is exactly six inches across. So I'm using that as my benchmark for the length of drawing out. I'm just drawing it out the length of the anvil face or the width of the anvil face. Mm -hmm. And that will help keep that exactly the same when they go together. Have you measured the circumference around your billet? No, I haven't, but no. it's whatever four and a half inches in diameter comes out to in circumference. Gotcha. Good question, though. I'm just curious because then you could, uh, depending on how much you wanted it to wrap around there, you could measure what, you know, the inside curve of the tongs you would like it to be. That is all highly overthinking it, considering it won't matter once you start to bend on them. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you're trying to figure out how much material you need 
There's going to be a lot of factors, but to get close, are you backed up the main camera? Yep. Okay. Um, to get real close, basically, I believe the formula is correct. I'm spouting it off. You shouldn't do math on camera. But I believe you take the diameter and you times that by 3.14, and that should give you your circumference or close to thereabout. So if you got a four and a half inch diameter, you times that by 3.14. And that should give you the circumference of the item in inches. And then I guess you would, if say you wanted it to take in grip halfway around, but not actually totally, if you're trying to just have one hook like that, you would then divide that diameter in half. And that would give you what your, that would give you what you would have on that curve. Now that's not necessarily saying that that's exactly how much material you would need to make it around that piece. Because you have to take into effect that you're going to be bending it. And whenever you bend something, it sucks up material. Because you've got to bend away from the other jaw, then come around. So technically you're not just coming around a piece like this, hooking around. So that extra bend, you've got to add a little extra material in for that. When in doubt, add a little extra on and then cut it off if you don't need it. These are tongs, not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I wish I was good at maths and stuff. Maths? <laughs> the maths Plural. and stuff. You know, it's like how Alex Steele says it. He's like, you know, maths. Uh -huh. <laughs> I just love when he says that. I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's 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 but my thought process. You thoughts, know, the maths. Your thoughts exactly, huh? Yeah. Copy Sports, he said, uh, he did a little promotion for us on our shirts. He said, nice t-shirts, love mine, so go buy one, lol. And I told him he should uh, share it on Instagram and tag us, and he said he would tomorrow, so yeah, I'm going to keep an eye out for that. <laughs> so speaking of shirts, I'm wearing one of my favorites right now <laughs> that we got there. It's the good enough for YouTube t-shirt. So uh, you can get those over there at the Teespring store. Mm -hmm. You'll definitely get some looks <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> wearing oh, a oh, shirt like this. I got the regular logo shirt on. Yep, the regular Christ and Ironworks logo shirt. That's kind of the common thing for a lot of YouTubers to do to help support their channels and what we're doing here on, on YouTube uh, is they have merchandise and things like that. That's a great way of supporting. Uh, yes, Dana, we do have the standard uh, Christ and I Works logo uh, shirt. I believe that's the first one on the Teespring page. Yep. Drayson69, have a blast at the conference, Roy and Jeff. I need to go. Be well, fellow Smiths. Will do. Drayson69, thank you again, sir, for everything. And we will have a blast. What the Forge Blacksmith thinks at Maths is the U UK way of abbreviating mathematics. <laughs> Maybe it's a formal thing over there, so. Well, I'm not that formal. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, for now I'm going to use a flatter. I'm going to just kind of clean up some of the hammer divots on the back side. So let's go to the anvil, Jess. All right. And I'm hoping that will give this, this will also stretch it that that last little bit there. It worked pretty good. Now I'll clean up the sides of these hammers. To clean up the sides, since the hammer face is wider than the piece, as long as you move progressively and keep your hammer blows nice and flat, it'll planish up the piece for you. Of course, I'm putting hammer blows right in where I've already hit, but there. Stop 
that all cleaned up. Now that's exactly the width of the hammer, uh, of the face. Of the anvil face. Now we need to set down our boss area. So now I'm going to heat the whole piece up, and I'm going to drive this boss down home. And I'm trying to match the width or the thickness of the reins for the boss area. So I'll hammer it down until I match that thickness in that direction. Sound good? Yeah, it does. Xander asks if you normally wear hearing protection. Uh, yes, I do in the shop all the time. I do not. So I am tone deaf to lower tones. So if I, um, I messed up, long story short, I messed up my hearing back when I was in heating and air conditioning. I did uh, some, basically I did some big industrial jobs and some commercial jobs where I was inside ductwork and I was cutting with a sawzall and I didn't wear hearing protection. Very dumb of me, uh, but basically that messed up my hearing um, to the point that I don't hear low tones very well. And believe it or not, my voice actually has a tone that I can't hear all that great. And so if I put hearing protection on, it'll sound like I'm yelling at your face. <laughs> yeah, he comes it's, in the house with hearing with uh, little earplugs in, and he's yeah. like twice as loud. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I would be two, at least three times louder than what I am right now that you're hearing me at. So if I were to wear hearing protection, so I stop. So I'm not wearing the hearing protection just for the live streams, basically. So this way you guys can not have to go deaf listening to me yell at you like I was angry or something. Big Dog Forge says, I see you lift the hammer and swing it downward at a great velocity. This blacksmithing thing could be something I get into. <laughs> ben Toom says, don't do it, Tim, it's addictive. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Yeah, Tim, you know, it's awful habit for me. <laughs> uh, Rock Mike says, when I'm really swinging the hammer, the back of my arm gets real tired and sore. Is this a technique issue? I guess I'm really sending the hammer on the downstroke with that tricep. Yeah, it's basically a bit of a technique issue. You're trying to force it too much. Uh, my arm doesn't get tired. And the reason why is because I'm using my entire shoulder and everything to accelerate the hammer, okay? I'm not using, I'm not using this force, like I'm trying to uh, throw it down like you're trying to punch something, right? And it's, that's what will hurt that tricep on you and cause it to get sore and wore out after a day. I know because I've done it. I've been trying to rush. That comes from trying to rush and get a lot of work done at that anvil as fast and as hard as you can hammer. And when you're doing that, that's when you're really just whirling that thing. You're really trying to throw that thing as hard as you can. And that's where that comes from. So my suggestion would just slow up a little bit. It's not that serious. Take another heat to get the work done. I'm bringing down a lot of force because I'm swinging with my whole arm and I'm bringing this hammer way up above my head in working with it, using the full range of motion. So that's where I'm developing that hitting energy at. It's not from the force of my forearm punching the material. So try that out. See if it works for you. Uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of one of those things you have to kind of be self-aware of what you're doing while you're standing there. Kind of just keep checking yourself as you go and, and adjust and tweet. What else, hon? Uh, Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah. Not too ranty. Xander says, I used to tell people I started bladesmithing because collecting swords was too expensive. That's a big joke. <laughs> 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 yep, it is an expensive hobby yeah. or profession. Yeah, blacksmithing's <laughs> very expensive. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to be. Um, if you enjoy forging in the dark in a ground forge, and you enjoy forging on a sledgehammer head as your anvil, and not having tongs, and not having power equipment, not having electricity, 
not having a leaf blower to blow into your little fire pit. Basically, if you go back to the Stone Age, it's pretty cheap uh, to forge stuff. But as soon as you want to take and move up a little bit, you want to get a better anvil. Um, you know, you want to get some electricity. You need to get a chop saw so you can chop off. Say you want to get into hammer, you know, doing <coughs> some sort of hammer billets. And you need to lop off some, you know, bigger chunks of steel. And you can't just do it with your old hacksaw. It starts, the price starts jacking up the more tools you add to it, for sure. The nature of the beast, unfortunately. What up, hon? Yeah. Um, we'll see. Bye, Luke. We'll see you next on the next one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, ben Toombs was asking John Coffee how many hammers he's bought today. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> John Coffee ought to buy a hammer for me. We'll see. Uh, like, I'll get him one from Harbor Freight. <laughs> and I'll resell it to you, Mr. Coffee. How's that sound? <laughs> I'll grind out the China logo in it and put my touch mark there. How's that sound? Xander Nichols says, I'm in California and my shop gets 145 degrees when I am forging. Any ideas to cool it down? <laughs> um, it was 145 plus degrees in my shop this week, so... The biggest thing you can do is big fans, invest in big fans. It's not necessarily going to cool down your shop, but you can stand in front of it and it will give you some reprieve from the heat. Uh, one of the other things you can do, I do this all the time, I keep a rag on top of my head and I keep it cool off with water. So as the water evaporates, it cools the top of my head, which then cools me down a little bit. Um, take frequent breaks. If you are in a really well insulated building, you can invest in some really expensive air conditioning equipment to keep it cool. But let's see here, your California West Coast uh, swamp cooler would probably be your friend. Get a couple big commercial grade swamp coolers and they have them installed in the shop. They don't work on the East Coast because you need to be able to evaporate the water through the evaporation cycle in order for them to actually work. So that's best done on the west coast where the humidity is low. Air conditioning. Take one heck of an air conditioner to overcome the heat coming off the forge. Yeah, you're probably talking at least a five to 10 ton air conditioning unit to keep the forge cool. All right, we're gonna work on these offsets and you keep feeding me All right. comments and we go over the anvil. All righty. Okay. Uh, what the Forge says, my recommendation for building up a nice shop is to save big purchases for tax returns and then slowly get half, half tools per paycheck as you go. In less than a year, I have almost everything I want. Then Tomb says, build your shop in Antarctica. <laughs> Heck yes. Who's with me? We need to start a blacksmithing commune up in Antarctica. It's a blacksmithing colony. Yeah. <laughs> the land's probably cheap. Uh, Eric, Eric Costa Rica says, I just finished my first forge and I will start blacksmithing tomorrow. Awesome. Sorry, everybody. It's going to be a little loud. Just trying to put some uh, finishing touches. Use the third hand control technique. That's right. Drop. <laughs> That's right. All right. Everybody see how that boss got formed? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to offset that boss with the next heat. We're going to heat it up, we're going to go to the far side of the anvil, and obviously just drop that box down with half on, half off blows. Mm -hmm. And for that, I'm going to switch to a much lighter hammer, because I don't need all of that big old heavy three pound pig anymore to do the drawing out. What's everybody think so far? 
Looks like it's coming along well. Yep. Uh, Eric Costa Rica says, your channel motivated me to start, and I will start forging tomorrow. Woohoo! It's awesome. Cool. That is awesome, Eric Costa Rica. That was what my channel is all about, buddy. It's inspiring people to get into this craft and to get a passion and a love for it like what I have. So if that is what I have done, mission accomplished for my channel. There's no better feedback than that right there. Rock Mike says, rushing it. Yep, great advice. Roy, thank you for answering the question. Maybe set up a camera and analyze my swing. That would be a perfect way of doing it, Rock Mike. Perfect way of doing it. A camera is not going to lie to you. If you suck on camera, you suck on camera, basically. It's, it's not going to lie. It's the most honest third-party observation that you can get. It's not biased in any way. <laughs> it's going to tell you all your dirty little secrets right there on film. So, uh, I'm glad that helps you. So I'm going to go back over the anvil. I'm going to do this right. next one here in a second here, Jeff. Okay. We're almost up to heat, so. All righty. Go ahead. More questions, please? Comments? Sure. Um, Keep following along. What the Forge says, I have found filming my work for YouTube very helpful and analyzing what I'm doing wrong. Yep, that's a good thing. Ben Toom says, one of my go-to hammers is a Harbor Freight hammer. I can't hear you, hon. You got to speak okay. up. I can't hear you, so. All right. Um, where was it? Oh, Ben Toom says, one of my go-to hammers is a Harbor Freight hammer. Yep. They're a good hammer. Kevin McIntyre, welcome. Kevin McIntyre, good to have you as part of the stream. This is your first time here, or second time, or third time, or fifth time, or tenth time, or any other time in between. Tomb says, I do irrigation for a living, and you can put up some misters on the eaves so they just spray water down like a swamp. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard of one guy doing that, uh, and somebody recommended a video not too long ago about that. I never did watch the video, unfortunately. I, it got lost among the annals of all the other emails and stuff. Can you go up here, baby? Yep. Come back to the animal. Thank you. Go ahead. More emails. All right. Um, let's see here. Rock Mike says, cool man, I think I'm going to try and film myself smithing. I know YouTube, I suck at smithing, but I sure enjoy it. Yeah, that's all right. We all got to start somewhere. We all suck at something. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed. You ever meet a person that says they don't really, they're not horrible at anything? That person I would stay far away from. <laughs> Everybody has something they're not good at. County Line Forge says on the East Coast, we go indoors in the heat of the day. Ha ha. Sometimes you just can't get away from it. What else, babe? Uh, Sean Allison says, love listening and watching y'all as I truck on down the road. No, I'm not driving now. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Glad you're listening to us as you truck on down the road. So these are going to have one special little benefit here. Uh, I haven't mentioned it. I haven't really talked about it yet. So I'm not going to pin these together tonight, uh, at least not for the stream. I like to drill my holes and stuff like that. It's going to take a while for these to cool down and stuff. But basically, what I will do 
Because once I'm happy with one half, we'll set it down. We'll go and we'll talk for a bit and other stuff. I'll let it cool down enough that I can dip it into some water. I'll end up reheating it later on. But I'm going to give these a handle. I can't, I totally can't see myself in that thing at all. So um, no. can you see me okay? Yeah, you're fine. I'm going to give these their very own tongue clip handles. So these are going to be made this way. I've decided I'm going to make all of my tongs this way, but there's going to be a slight variation in twists. In this style, I just looped it around. I just looped this around, but I've decided with these tongs, I'm actually going to slit and drift a hole in the end of the tong for the tong loop, mm -hmm. for the ring. So we might, depending on time, well wall that up. You have to do that before you put these things together. Otherwise, it becomes a real big pain in the butt to try to do that. So mm -hmm. you have to do that while these are apart. That's why I said these won't be finished tonight, but we'll get them mostly formed. All right. All right. Back in the fire it goes. Yep. And we go, stay at the anvil. OK. You can stay there. To the anvil. Any questions? All right. Because right now, we're just going to push that, <laughs> that boss over and give it that offset. Go ahead. Uh, let's see. Uh, if I missed anybody's questions earlier, go ahead and uh, drop them back in there, and I'll get read them off for you. Uh, Louis Elias, uh, sorry, don't speak Spanish here, so I'll have to drop it in in English if you can. Yep. Kevin McIntyre, hey, I have the same problem with looking old and fat in my mirror. What's up with that? Just gotta get rid of the mirrors. Or get like one of those carnival ones, you know, like make you look cobbler or something. <laughs> <laughs> ben Toon says, inner city mechanics garage, they have those above the doors. The spray misters. Oh yeah? Forge says, I'm going to build a hammer rack. Just don't know how big to make it. Oh, well, future hammers and such. <laughs> Probably just plan to like triple up whatever you have currently. <laughs> JTHM 2011. I noticed new cameras and camera presets. When did that happen? That happened, was it about three months ago? Um, it happened later spring, yeah. at least. But uh, yes, yeah, we went away from using the cell phone for the streaming. Although the cell phone's much easier um, as far as just like pressing a button and you're ready to go. But the cameras we're using currently, they do have a lot, uh, they do a lot nicer footage. I think it can, you can put it in 720 or 1080p. Yes, his flatter is a hammer with a plate welded to it. He did the poor man's flatter. I think that's the name of the yep, video. Poor boy's flatter. Mm -hmm. At least that was the name that the guy who gave it that brought it and introduced it to Quad State. Mm -hmm. um, this face, to be clear, this face has been annealed or has been uh, at least heated with a torch to take the temper out of it to reduce the hardness. And the hammer that I strike it with is a mild steel or soft base hammer. It's not a hard steel hammer. So there we go. We got one half done. The really mega tongs. Mm -hmm. Just to give you guys some sense of the scope of how big this is, right now we're sitting at, yeah, almost there, uh, inch and seven eighths wide, six inches long from the tip of the boss out to the edge, six inches, and then we are roughly half inch thick material. And the whole thing's about two, two foot, almost two and a half foot long. Just give you a sense of, just give you a kind of a sense of the scale. So what do you all think about that? Look good? Sanders says, pretty cool. Uh, Rock Mike says, 
Here's another shirt for you. We all suck at something. LOL. A new shirt for you, Roy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We all suck at something. <laughs> <laughs> is the plate hardened? Is that on the flatter, I suppose? Nope, it's just a mild steel plate. There's no point for it to be hardened. <laughs> Corey Shire, he's saying back to Kevin, your mirror hates you and lies to you. It's a conspiracy between the mirror and your bathroom scale. I got the same thing going on here, all <laughs> <laughs> Here's the bathroom fixtures. <laughs> uh, so, hmm? Are you back to the main camera? Yes, I am. Okay. So I'm going to set this off to the side and just let this kind of cool down naturally until it gets cool enough that I can dunk it without fear of adding any undue stress. You guys can see how long these tongs are. They're pretty big. They are very big, yes. You want to keep really good thickness in these, though. Um, they've got to have good thickness to be able to withstand all the force that you're going to put them under. Lose that guy right there on the flat to a rim. Keep going. Go ahead. Ah, yes. Uh, Techomatic. I mentioned earlier that I just purchased a 229-pound Queen's Cross English Pattern Anvil. Can't wait to pick it up. Haven't thought of a name for it yet. <laughs> ah, all right, everybody. Drop it down in the comment yeah. section Just the what name. he should name his anvil. Rock Mike says the name will come to you when you start beating on it. Yeah. Call it Shirley Temple. <laughs> Shirley Temple. That way you can tell people that I'm going to go out in my shop and beat on Shirley Temple. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> I don't know why that's just funny, but it just is. It sounds funny. Louis Elias translated his phrase, it was because you threw water on the fire. What's that again? Uh, what was his phrase? He, he had said something in Spanish and then he translated it and it was because you threw water on the fire. Oh, okay. Well, if it was a question about throwing water on the fire, the reason why I put that is to keep the flames under control. <laughs> if it was a question. If it was a statement, can't help you there. <laughs> Sean Allison said that's going to be a ginormous set of tongs. Yes, it is. It's going to be interesting how much they weigh. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're going to be, be a quite hefty. spicy, heavy-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeehaw! Um, let's see. We do have, we got our list for whenever you're ready to go over that, Roy, of supporters. Yes, I'll, I'll take that here in a second, right after this next heat. Let's take this next heat. I agree with you, Corey. Queenie was the name I thought, too. Queenie. It's that last, sounds nice. The last time I've heard that name used was out of the Berenstain Bears book. <laughs> so, <laughs> back from my childhood. All right, we're good and hot. Let's go to the anvil. All righty. Okay. Made out of rod iron. 
with steel face as well as one. I've been partial to those ever since I took a class making one with Tom Latman. That's my go-to. Technotic, maybe I should call it Freddy. Freddy Campbell. <laughs> Fred. <laughs> You're silly. Boom. So, I think we're good. Alrighty. Basically, all I'm doing here is just straightening things out. That way, I've got a good straight platform to go off of. I'm leaving these a little rougher forged than what I would normally leave my ironwork just because I've got four other pairs I need to make. So this is one of those things, they need to hold what they need to hold. They don't need to be the job itself. So that's a theory that I work on in my shop. When you're doing this for a living or a profession, there's a certain amount of leeway that you have to give yourself. You know, of course you want professional looking tools, right? You want tools that are a statement of all your skill work, right? You want them to all be just as beautiful and as perfect as possible. Those are big tongs. Mm -hmm. You know, so of course you want all that stuff, right? You want your cake and you want to eat it too, by golly. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. The problem with it is, and here's your main problem, is when you've got a customer waiting on their order, it's more important that you get the order to them than for you to have a pretty set of tongs sitting in your shop. So it's more important to me to get the job done than it is for me to fool around making this perfect, no hammer blow pair of tongs where everything's exactly the same dimensions and things like that. So close enough is close enough. Good enough is good enough in this case. They're meant to hold pieces of large pieces of material, not win artist awards. How's that look? Looks good. What does everybody think? Wow, well, everybody's saying they look ugly. No, bend tubes, they double as a hammer, lol. <laughs> <laughs> Beat it with some tongs. Well, like I said, just as a scale reference, there's a three pound hammer, and here's the tongs themselves. Mm -hmm. They're a mighty big set of tongs. Yes, they, they are. They're going to grip quite a bit of things. Uh, Techromatic, what will you be using these tongs for, Roy? So I'll show you a little bit earlier in the stream. We'll let those cool down, but I'll show it again. We're going to be using it on that 30 pound block of steel. That is going to become a sledgehammer. It's like a small anvil in itself. Yep. This is for a customer. I have been contracted out to do this job, commissioned, if you will, whatever you want to call it, to make a 30 pound sledgehammer. Big Dog Forge, got to go, guys. See you soon. God bless and be safe. You other Smiths can't deny. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, thank you for being here, brother. We appreciate you. <laughs> Go back to the main cam. All right. All right. Uh, let that cool. By the way, um, I know some of you will have to be running soon, so we'll go ahead and give you our yep. updates on the next couple of live streams. Yeah. Uh, the one on Monday, we're having a special YouTube-related live stream. So normally we have our business live streams at 7 p.m. Eastern time on Monday, and they're just about general blacksmithing business and just business in general of any type. Uh, but specifically, we'll be talking about um, doing business in a YouTube type of sense, whether it's running a channel and kind of everything involved there. So. For those of you that have a small channel and you want to pick our brains about it, make sure you come and hang out and bring your questions. And uh, anybody else who's thought about starting a channel, you know, feel free, free to stop in too. And even if you're not interested and you want to hang out, you know, come hang out. Yeah. So, um, like our next busy. Friday night live stream, we will not be having a live stream. I think Roy said that already. But yep. so next Friday in the live stream. Yeah, next live stream, there. well, next Friday there will be no live stream. I will be 
up at the RABA conference. So I will be the conference demonstrator this year at RABA. So that's what I will be doing. Don't do that. You can put it away. Yay, yay, yay. Things in my way when it doesn't need to be in my way. There we go. All right, well, while those things cool down, I'm going to go ahead and bend the chain link loop that will end up being welded. It'll be It'll get thread through the ends of the tongs and then forge welded just like a chain. And so I'm going to go ahead and bend that into a U shape and then cut it off so this way I can make, uh, make it into a link and get it prepared to thread through the eye of the tong handle. Okay. All right, Len Blacksmith says very good, Roy. Heavy duty, maybe? Oh, yeah, very heavy duty this time. Well, you know, I wouldn't want any weak tongs around here. No. I wouldn't want any weak tongs. Don't want that. You know, I don't really know how to make tongs. <laughs> <laughs> BMB Forge says, I still cannot think of why you would need a 30 pound hammer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the customer, uh, the customer that ordered this hammer, uh, he works for the circus, I believe, is it? The I, think, I think so. I think he works for the circus, and basically he's going to use it on those little carnival games, you know, where you hit them and ding the bell. It's going to be one of those type deals. So um, it's going to have some decorative chasing on the side of it, a whole bunch of other stuff, but it's going to be a really pretty hammer uh, when I get it done. But we'll see how he likes that. I'm sure he'll like it very, very well. A lot of effort into it. Ed Gray Wolf, no stream from the conference. Uh, no, Roy will be there Friday nope. setting up. The conference technically does not start till Saturday. Yep. So, and as it's being uh, first time there, sometimes it's difficult to try to pull off something as uh, complex as a, as a stream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go over the anvil. So I've got a cone in the anvil here, or a bic. I'm just going to bend it around this bic here. Nice, easy peasy. This is 3 8 rod or 9.5 mil. And I'm just bending it to what about looks about right for a link for this size tongs. So that's about right for me. Because I want it to be, if you picture like this, this is how you want your hands to be on it. You don't want them really tight together where you're just holding on to the reins like this. You want them to be kind of sprung like this. So you want that to kind of mimic that, if you see. Can they see that? Yes. You want that to mimic that. Mm -hmm. So now I've got that bit. Take the cone out. Bring up the hardy tool. Bring it back to where it's just touching this top part's just touching the hardy tool and just go a little past it and give it a nick and then that's where we're going to end up chopping this piece off we're going to heat that piece back up and take and nib that right off nip it right off nip it right off Lynn Blacksmith, uh, it's still daylight, yes, it's at 8.30 in the evening, and I, yep. my camera makes it look way brighter than it actually is. <laughs> it's funny, it looks super bright yeah. here. It, it looks nearly like mid, like about noon, uh, but actually the sun's setting behind me, um, or well, in front well, of me. Well, in front that of That way, but yeah. But yeah, um, so here in about an hour it'll be solidly dark here. Yep. Let me have the list of supporters, Jess. I'm yes. going to take a moment to acknowledge everybody who's been supporting the live streams over the last month. This is something we do every live stream to show our appreciation and to give everybody a chance to show your appreciation for these people that support these streams with their Super Chat donations. Specifically, <coughs> a lot of these folks support us not only in this stream, but they also support us on our Monday Night Business live streams as well. So, uh, we're going to start the list off with Billy Strong, Graham Pepper, Gordon Family Forge, North County Forge, or Country, North Country Forge, I think it's Country, KJ Owens, Peter Tricker, Shadowcaster, What the Forge, Blacksmithing, Paul Ellis, or Silly Up as we know him, County Line Forge, 
Darren Energy Management, Coffee's Forge, Brave Skin, Tapgrammatic, Liam Buck, Dana Major, Majori, Majori, Jason Sullivan, Shamrock Forge, uh, Rishi Sun, D. Thomas, and For the Honor Forge. Thank you all so much for the support. Everybody give them a hand clap down in the comment section down below. Just wanted to take and make sure we took the proper acknowledgement and give credit where credit is due. We greatly appreciate y'all. Yes, we do. So, now let's go back over the fourth animal test. Okay. And we'll go ahead and nick this off here. Do a little nip. just so this way we have it, just in case next time. Just in case something doesn't work out. That's always an important thing. <laughs> Bill Miller, 30 pound hammer, you'll just need Samson to swing that thing, yikes. How many strikers will you need to forge that monster? <laughs> um, don't know yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. For strikers, something about that size, you can get away with two people easy. Not two people. It looks like it's a monster. It's not really that bad when you're swinging sledges at it for the war. Unlike a lot of hammering work that's done with a striker, it's very controlled and stuff like that. With billets this big, it's swing for the fences and, uh, you know, Swing as fast and as hard as you can, basically, with as heavy of a hammer as you can possibly swing. And that's kind of the concept behind if you're going to do it with striking. Uh, we'll have to see if I've got access um, to a power hammer. If not, it'll be done with striking work. So if I do that, I might just film that part of it just to show that it can be done with strikers. and. Uh, Show it that way. I love working with strikers versus uh, not having <coughs> uh, strikers or just working with power hammers. Because power hammers are quite mindless. So, all right, we're going to go over the anvil. Yes? All righty. Okay, we're going to go ahead and set down our scarves for this piece. This is just like making a chain. Just like forging a chain link, basically, that's exactly what it is. It's just forging a chain link. I'm not going to close that up because Roy remembers. You close it up, then you can't fit it through the hole. <laughs> um, so basically all we've done is forge this exactly like a chain link. I don't know if they can see that. Yep, it's fine. There you go. Mm -hmm. So we're forging that just like a chain link. We're going to set that aside. That's good to go. So we'll just set this right in the front. And now, the top is back. Now let's see if we've got one of these cool enough. We're going to pick one of these two here. Whichever one I feel has a little longer rain to it. And that's going to be the one we'll drift the hole in. Yeah. Not real long rain, but that'll work fine. I think that'll work just fine. That'll work fine. Okay. So I'm going to do this one to drip, put, drip the hole in. Hmm? I'm going to cool them off those. So this way they can be handled. They didn't make a whole lot of hissing, so that's a good sign. That means they mostly cooled off in the time we forged that. You can go back to main camera, huh? All right.
Questions, yes. Um, sure, Rock Mike uh, says I gotta go. Closing chores to view. Thanks for the live stream stream. Really enjoy them. Hey, glad you enjoy them, Rock Mike. Thank you for being here, by the way. Mm -hmm. Which one did I choose? <laughs> and there's also been kind of an ongoing thing about what times it is in different parts of the U.S. Lynn Blacksmith has lots of variations in time in the U.S. A <laughs> little bit. Oh yeah. Give me that card. Keep them flowing, Jess. All right. I uh, can't see them, so. All righty. You gotta keep them going. Corey Shire, I think, I would think that that sledge would be used to drive in the big top tent stakes instead of used in one of the games. <laughs> it Maybe. might just like, find nope. its home in doing that, too. Yeah, opening ceremony or something. This guy's going to end up giving away a whole lot of teddy bears. A whole lot of teddy bears. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Tecromatic says, so who wants to hear what the Saturday night lotto numbers are as we're in the future? <laughs> <laughs> Xander, we are located near Dayton, Ohio. Yep. Now, I've got a small slitting punch here. This is what I'm going to use to spot punch through the handle itself. And then I will go through progressive drifting to drift a loop in the end of the handle before we thread the link through and get it forged welded up. So this will be the first drift that comes off this. This will take it to roughly half inch in diameter and then I will take it up just above half inch ever so slightly with this drift right here. I will drift it just a slight bit larger just so there's some wiggle room in there. Zachary Zipperman says, great stream. I enjoy watching your videos. Hey, I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. What the Forge Blacksmithing says, daylight savings is stupid. Only the U.S. government would cut an inch off of one end of a blanket, sew it to the other, and then call it a longer blanket. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not particularly fond of daylight savings either. Yep. We don't pay attention too much to daylight savings time. I mean, it kind of happens, but other than the fact that there's businesses that go by that, that you have to tune yourself to and realize, oh, it's not five o'clock, it's actually six o'clock. You know, we gained an hour, that's right. We sprung ahead, right? Like, instead of like that, you have to pay attention to those sort of things, but you know, when it comes to around the house and stuff, we don't really pay attention too much to that. Five o'clock is the same as five o'clock. Eight o'clock is the same as eight o'clock. So. Corey said there's six time zones. Don't forget Alaska and Hawaii. It's been a little while since I've looked at a little time zone map, so I don't remember it right off the, right off the bat. That is interesting. All right, so we got this good and hot. Let's go over the anvil, Jess. All right. And just as a subject of time, this will take a whole heck of a lot less time for me to actually do if I'm not on camera. Uh, you know, whenever you are on camera, it's difficult to kind of show time because 